Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Ophir here with you, and glad you are with us uh, this afternoon. Hope you're ready for a study from God's Word. We're going to be discussing a misconception that people have about the Church of Christ and something we believe. Uh, friends, let me just say that sometimes uh, instead of just taking uh, what you think people believe at face value, why don't you examine the Church of Christ? Or why don't you examine what people actually believe instead of going by what you've heard? Because oftentimes what you've heard has been twisted or, or, I don't know, maligned in some way. And what you are really hearing is a fabrication about what somebody really believes. And that's especially true when it comes to the Lord's Church. Uh, the Lord's Church is, uh, is is trying to get back to the Bible. We want to do Bible things in Bible ways, and we want to be known for that. We want to get back to the Bible, and we encourage you to examine what's being said. I, I never uh, expect you to take what I say at face value. I want you to open the Bible, and I want you to examine for yourself. And so one of the most commonly believed things about the Church of Christ is concerning salvation. I think probably instrumental music, the fact that we don't use instrumental music because it's not commanded in the Bible, uh, is one thing that is a distinguishing mark of the Church of Christ that most people know. And again, that even that itself, people think we don't like music. No, we like music. It's just that God doesn't command or request or ask. He doesn't, he doesn't want mechanical instruments of music in worship to Him. Now, outside of that, we we uh, you know don't have a problem with mechanical instruments of music, but when it comes to worshiping God, whether in the assembly or in our homes, we are not going to worship God using mechanical instruments of music. So, but the one thing that we're going to be talking about today is is uh, the part that water baptism plays in salvation. I've I've heard folks from the Church of Christ being called water dogs, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, derogatory names because of what the Bible teaches about, salva uh, about salvation and about baptism and the part it plays in that. And so and instead of just, you know, instead of calling us water dogs or things like that, why don't you just examine what the Bible says? That's what we're doing today. That's what we want to do. And if you, maybe you have that idea. Maybe you think that we're a water dog and you want to call, come in and call me a water dog. That's fine. But let's get scripture. If we're going to have a discussion, we're going to have some scripture here. So I really hope that that uh, that you're looking at this objectively, and that you are wanting to know the truth, because that's definitely what we're going to discuss today, having to do with water salvation. Do members of the Church of Christ believe in water salvation? What do we believe about baptism when it comes to salvation? That's all coming up on a word from the Lord uh, today, folks. Let me tell you this. Uh, uh, this is a live program, so if you want to call in, you can call in 336-427-9696, 336-427-9696, that's 427-WMYN, or 627-9563, 627-9563-627-WLOE, or you can reach me at 276-340-2653. 276-340-2653. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is my email address. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me by email. And uh, give me a call. Let me know that you're uh, that you're studying along with us. We'd be glad to uh, hear from you. But if you want to call and be a part of the program uh, live, uh, go ahead and call any of those numbers and we'll get into our Bible lesson. So, uh, first of all, when we're talking about baptism. We need to understand some basics because there are some things about baptism that people misconstrue. They don't. Uh, they don't understand. Just because, friends, just because you call something by a name doesn't mean that's what it is. Okay, you can, uh, you know, you can call a thistle. You can call it a rose, but that's really not what it is. It's a, it's a thistle. It'll always be a thistle, no matter how many times you call it a rose. It's, it's still a thistle, and that is true about baptism. Baptism. It is a specific thing that has a specific definition. You can't just slap uh, slap a label on something and say, well, it's baptism. And there are three things, really, that you need to understand about baptism or, or scriptural baptism. 
is, and the first thing is it requires a certain element. That is, it requires a certain uh, medium into which a person is baptized. All right, so baptism, scriptural baptism, requires a proper medium. Now, we know there are several uh, different kinds of baptism in the Bible, uh, and I think we've mentioned those before on this program. You've got, thing, you've got baptisms like John's baptism, which John's baptism was in water, but it was a it was for a specific purpose. It was to prepare the people for the Christ who was going to come. Uh, you have uh, uh, Moses' baptism. Moses, uh, in First Corinthians ten verse two, we're going to get into this in a little bit later. First uh, Corinthians ten two, the Bible says they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Uh, you had the baptism of fire. You had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You had the baptism of, uh, you know cups and saucers and plates and things like that which is simply a washing but all of those all of those are different kinds of baptism but in the in Ephesians 4 verse 5 Paul said there's one Lord one faith one baptism so that one baptism is a very particular kind that is it's going to take place in a certain medium that is it's going to take place in water and you say well James what are kind of baptism is well I mean, you can be immersed. Some of them say, well, I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to be baptized in buttermilk. Well, you can be dumped in buttermilk. You can be immersed in buttermilk, but that doesn't, that's not what God commands. The Bible example of baptism is water. All right? So that's what we're going to look at. Now, so how do you know? Someone said, well, James, how do you know that it, it was water? How, how do you know that the baptism, the one baptism, uh, that the Bible talks about that's required is baptism in water. Well, friends, I want you to consider uh, Acts chapter 10 and verse 47. This is the account of Cornelius, and most people will know this account uh, probably because they are familiar with or they, they've heard about the Holy Spirit baptism and they think that that's what saved Cornelius, but that was not the case. But listen to what is said about Cornelius's salvation and about baptism and the element that into which he was baptized. So in Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, I'm in verse 44, Acts 10, 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Now, here's one thing that I know from this verse. Number one, that the one baptism that is required today, Ephesians 4, 5, 1 baptism, was not the Holy Spirit baptism because Cornelius had received the Holy Spirit like the apostles had on the day of Pentecost. That's what Peter says in Acts chapter 11. And so, so he'd already, they'd already received the Holy Spirit as a sign to those with Peter, to the Jews that were with Peter, uh, an indication that the Gentiles should receive the gospel. That was the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit being poured out on Cornelius. But listen to what Peter says. Peter says, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? Who, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So they already received the Holy Ghost, and Peter says, Who's going to forbid them from being baptized in water? Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? Are you going to withhold water and prevent these people from being baptized? Now, why would Peter say that? Why would he insist that they have another baptism, a baptism uh, in water, if the Holy Spirit baptism was, was the one for today? And then the very next verse says, verse 48, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. So, I know that the baptism that we're talking about today is 
not the Holy Spirit baptism because it, the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon Cornelius and Peter still commanded them to be baptized in water in the name of the Lord. Now, how do, you, how do I know that he wasn't commanded them to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, again, they'd already been baptized in the Holy Spirit. But Peter's giving another command that they should be baptized. Friends, you cannot, you cannot command Holy Spirit baptism, and it be and it be uh, followed. I can tell you today, you've got to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and not a single person can obey that command because Jesus is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. John chapter one and verse uh, thirty-three. John 1, verse 33, John the Baptist said, John the Baptizer said, I knew him not, but he that sent me, that's God, to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Jesus is the one who baptized with the Holy Ghost. So if someone is commanding you to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, you can't fulfill that because Jesus is the one who has to administer it. Whatever baptism Peter was talking about had to be administered by men, by you know, by individuals. Why? Because he commanded it. He commanded it, and therefore they had to they had to submit to it. And the only way you can submit to something uh, and allow someone to be to baptize you is if it's something other than being baptized in the Holy Spirit. You do, you just cannot be baptized in the Holy Spirit today. Uh, furthermore, in, in um, Matthew twenty eight. In Matthew 28 and verse 19, listen to this. Here's the great commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Now, Jesus commanded that they go and teach all nations and they baptize. So, the command was to teach and to baptize. So how 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 how, 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 how is it that um, how is it that they could be baptizing people if in fact uh, it was the Holy Spirit baptism? See, they they couldn't go forth and baptize people in the Holy Spirit. All right. So now, what we need to consider then is the element. Jesus said, go and teach all nations and baptize them. What were they baptized in? Well, it had to be water. It had to be some element that they could immerse someone in. So the one baptism in Ephesians 4 and verse 5 is in water and not the Holy Spirit. I know it must be water because look at this. In Acts chapter 8, and I'm, we're going to come to uh, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch again in a moment, but look at this. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 36, Acts chapter 8, verse 36. As they went on their way, now this is Philip preaching to uh, the eunuch, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now, why did the, why did the eunuch even ask about water baptism? Why did he put baptism with water? Why did he connect that? Because it had been taught to him by Philip. I don't know that Philip said anything about Holy Spirit baptism. Prove to me that Philip said something to the eunuch about Holy Spirit baptism. It's not in the, not in the text. But I guarantee you he said something to, to the eunuch about being baptized in water. Why? Because the eunuch asked about it. He said, see, here's water. What does hinder me to be baptized? The only reason why he'd ask that is if he had been taught, you need to be baptized in water for a specific purpose. So we're talking about the element. You have to be baptized in water. It must be water. Otherwise, the eunuch would have said, see, there, there's, you know, there's a big pool of buttermilk out there. What's hindered me to be baptized? Well, I mean, if he had said that, then we'd know Philip had been teaching him that you have to be baptized in buttermilk. Or, you know, as he's going down the road, why didn't he say, look, there's, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's see, here's iced tea. Why don't we take the next tea plunge? Well, because that's not what you're baptized in. The element must be water. So baptism, basics of baptism requires 
Number one, it requires water. Baptism requires water to be immersed in. John was baptizing in the River Jordan where there was much water. And so, uh, in John 1 verse 33, we just read, God sent, uh, John said, He that sent me, he that sent me to baptize in water. So, we know that John was sent to baptize with water. So, it requires water. Number one, that's what it requires. Number two, it requires a certain group of people. It requires a certain group of people. Uh, baptism requires someone being taught or having the ability to be taught. You know, there's some people that just can't be taught. And I'm not making fun of anybody, but I'm saying we know there's some people that are born with mental deficiencies and they don't have all the capacity to, to learn. And they may be, you know, they may be, as they grow up, they still have the development of a child, and so they don't understand uh, things that are necessary to be taught about, about salvation. So if they don't have the ability to be taught, then baptism is not for them. Matthew 28, 19 to 20, again, the, the Great Commission, we just read this. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. So, Baptism is connected to a group of people who have been taught. Now, keep this in mind. There are some groups of people that just cannot be taught. All right? Number two, it requires a certain group of people that can believe and that can confess Christ. Now, how do I know that? Because look what the Bible says. In Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8 and verse uh, 36, we get back here to the unit. Acts chapter 8 and verse 36. As they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the water to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So it requires someone believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. If you can't be taught, you know, if you don't have the capacity to, to learn, to be taught, you don't have the capacity then to believe what you're being taught. All right? In other words, you don't have the, the, the ability to reason whether Jesus is indeed the Son of God or not. And if you don't have that ability, then you don't have to worry about it. You get to heaven on a baby ticket. All right? You're safe. But individuals who can be taught, they're going to be taught that baptism is for the mission of sins and they must believe and they must confess Christ. That is, they must confess that they believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, someone who is a candidate for baptism has to repent. They have to repent. In Acts 2 and verse 38, you recall that on the day of Pentecost, they said, men and brethren, what? What shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. So there has to be they have to have the ability to repent. Jesus said, Except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now, there are some people, there are some persons that don't need to repent. They can't repent because they don't need to repent. I'm talking about children, babies. Infants, see, there's a, there's a group of people that, that just cannot repent, and so they're not then candidates for baptism because one of the requirements for being baptized is that you repent of your sins. So if you have no sins to repent of, if you're born in innocence, you're not born in sin, that's, that's, that's a devil's lie, this born in sin business. It's not in the Bible, far into the scriptures, it condemns infants who die, so I don't know why anybody would believe that. So, so infants don't need to be baptized because they can't repent. Now think about it, friends. See, scriptural baptism, Bible baptism, requires certain people, people who can be taught, people who can believe and uh, have confessed Christ, and people who repent. Now, does that mean that only infants are excluded? No, there's some people that aren't candidates for baptism because, let's say, they refuse to be taught. 
they maybe they just they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear the gospel. They don't want to be taught. Okay, they still need to be baptized, but no one's going to baptize them. That's why Jesus said, "He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved; but he that believeth not shall be damned." Someone who doesn't believe is not going to be baptized anyway. But what if someone does believe? So what if someone says, well, I believe Jesus is the Son of God? And they make that confession. Or can they be baptized? Well, not if they don't repent. Let's say, let's, say, let's say, well, I'm not going to repent. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, but I'm not going to repent. Well, why would you be baptized then? As a matter of fact, John the baptizer, John was in the business of baptizing people. You recall in Matthew chapter, in Matthew chapter three, in verse eight, the Bible says uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to his baptism. He said unto them, "O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance." These people were coming to be baptized, but they weren't going to repent of the the corruption that they had made in uh, toward the law the traditions that they had added and, and so forth. They weren't repenting of that. Well, friends, if you're not going to repent, there's no point in being baptized for the remission of sins because God's not going to remit, remove those sins if you're not repenting of them. I've talked to people who who are, uh, were, were, you know, they were shacking up. You know, boyfriend, girlfriend. Yeah, we're, we're, going, we're, we're going to live together. Well, if you're going to keep living together, I'm not going to baptize you. If, you, if you're going to keep living with this girl or living with this guy, you're going to keep fornicating, you're not repenting. The Bible says a fornicator cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And you mean to tell me that you want to be baptized for the remission of sins, knowing that you're going to just keep right back on, you're going to keep on doing the very thing that, you're, that, that the Bible condemns? No. John said, bring forth fruit, meet for repentance. So if repentance is not going to be made, that person is not a candidate for baptism. So it requires certain people. It requires water. It requires a certain people. And it also requires a certain action. Now, friends, this is really where, where we're getting down to the, uh, the crux, the, the, the important aspect of baptism. This is where people change the definition. The, the definition of baptism is to, to dip. To baptize means to dip, to plunge, or immerse, submerge, okay? And the Bible describes it as a burial. A burial. Colossians 2, verse 12, you're buried with him in baptism. Uh, Colossians 2, 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So it is a burial. Now, friends, when you bury something, that is, you, you totally cover it. Now, another picture, if you will, of what baptism really is, is in Romans chapter three, uh, 6, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. For if we have been, here it is, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, there's the idea of being planted. Friends, if you plant something, you bury it. All right? If you plant something, you, you submerge it. You, uh, uh, you know, you cover it up. You say, well, I plant, I plant some um, uh, plants in my garden. I don't totally cover them up. You bury the roots. That's what you planted it. You planted the roots, the part that belongs in the ground. That's what you planted. All right, the part that needs to be buried. That's what you. That's what you plant. That's what you cover up. That's what you you immerse or you submerge. You you bury. All right, and so this is what we're talking about. Baptism is a burial, and it requires a going down into the water, and a coming up out of the water. Now, this is, this is why this is important. Because when someone says, well, sprinkling is baptism. No, it's not. Sprinkling is not baptism. Sprinkling is not baptism any more than 
uh, you know, I don't know, I'm losing the uh, uh, illustration here. But, but spring is not baptism. I mean, you didn't immerse anything. You hadn't submerged anything. You hadn't buried anything by sprinkling some water on it or pouring some water on, on, on a baby's head. You know, you see these people that, that are going to have their infant baptized and, they, and the, the priest or whoever it is, he takes a little cup of water and he pours on the baby, baby's head. That, that, he didn't baptize that baby. You poured water on his head. You go down there to the beauty shop and you ladies to get your hair fixed. Uh, what that's called is, that's called a rinse. That's not a baptism, that's a rinse. See? A baptism is a, is a total immersion, submerged. Plunged, dipped, all right, and so that that is about it's a going into being buried and coming up out of. Now here's the picture again. Let's go back to our our friend the eunuch in Acts chapter eight. In Acts chapter eight and verse thirty six, what do you find? As they went on the way, they came to a certain water. So there's the element, the right element came to water, and the eunuch said, "See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized?" So he understood he was to be immersed, dipped, plunged into water. But was he the right candidate? Was he the right person for a baptism? Well, Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Now, obviously, he had been taught, right? And now Philip's going to see, well, do you believe? Do you believe? And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So we know he was a taught person. He was someone who believed. We know that he was willing to make the confession. Now, the fact that he was making these changes shows that he was repenting, which is what repentance is. So now, the only thing necessary is for him to be baptized. How was he baptized? Verse 38, he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he, Philip, baptized him, the eunuch. And when they were come up out of the water. So they went down into the water and Philip buried him in the water. Plunged him underneath the water. Submerged him in the water. And then he came up out of the water. Now friends, that is, that is the, the, the scriptural uh, picture of baptism. Uh, he went down into the water, covered, submerged, he, uh, buried, and then he came up out of the water. So that rules out all this infant baptism, all this sprinkling. That rules out all these people that, well, I'm, I'm down here in the Methodist church, whatever, and I got some guys flicking water on me. That's not, that's not a baptism. It's not immersion. So it requires, I mean, just because you say, well, you, you say, well, well, James, I've been baptized. I've been immersed in water, okay? But was it for the right reason? Were you the right candidate? Were you, right, were, you, were you the right person? Was it for the right reason? See? Was it for the remission of sins? There's a lot of elements that are, that are involved in biblical baptism other than just kind of going through the motion or making sure you got one or two things right. Because you have a lot of people that have been immersed. Right? I heard one fellow say, he said, man, I, he said, uh, I was baptized a hundred times one year. And I thought, what are you, you crazy? You done lost your mind. What do you mean? I looked at him funny. He said, yeah. He said, I was immersed, uh, baptized uh, about a hundred times one, one summer. I said, how's that? And he goes, well, I was jumping off in my, my cousin's swimming pool. Oh, uh, well, he, he was being, he was being immersed. He was immersing himself. But he wasn't being baptized, and it wasn't for the right reason, and it certainly wasn't because he was a a taught believer who was repenting of his sins and had confessed Christ. But yet he was being immersed. But it wasn't a, it wasn't a scriptural baptism. It wasn't for the right reason. So it takes the right person, the right medium, for the right reasons, and that's baptism. Now, friends, why is this important? You said, James, I thought you were going to talk about the 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 Church of Christ and you water dogs and why y'all believe in water salvation. Well, here's what, I'm, here's what I'm telling you, friends. God puts water between man and blessings. And he's always done that. He's done that in the Old Testament. When you read through the Old Testament and things are written aforetime, were written for our learning, Romans 15, 4. So we know that there are some 
uh, some illustrations in the Old Testament of how God did things that we should, we're to learn from. We're to learn how God does things, how he operates in certain situations to see uh, how he's going to deal with us. And this is what we're talking about. God put water between man and the blessings that he provided for man just to see if man would do it. For example, the Red Sea. Well, you know the story that Moses in the Red Sea. Here the children of Israel backed up to the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 15. They're back to the Red Sea, and God tells, God tells Moses, uh, Wherefore cries thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward, but lift up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Now, what was it, uh, what was it that, that they were going to get? What was, what was the benefit here? Well, they were going to escape bondage. They were going to escape bondage, but it had to be on God's plan, God's terms. And so God says, go through the Red Sea. Now, later when we read 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says that was a baptism. They were baptized in the, under, the, into Moses, under Moses in the cloud and the sea. Water was all around them. They were immersed submerged and so it was a it was a uh, it was a baptism and notice this so they go through they go through let's notice this let's skip on down to verse 21 and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left and the Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, even all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through, through the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels and they dra that they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, and the waters that may come again upon the Egyptians, upon the chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength. When the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. And the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. The waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord, listen, saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. What did God put between Israel and salvation? Baptism. Paul called, called it a baptism. And as a matter of fact, if you were back up to verse 13, Exodus 14 to verse 13, Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord. What did they have to do in order to be saved? They had to be baptized. They had to go through the water. God put water between Israel and salvation. Israel and freedom from bondage. And it's called a baptism. Now, that's just one example. Another example is, is, is in uh, 2 Kings 5. In 2 Kings 5, you have Naaman. Naaman, we know the story, Naaman was a leper. And he was a great man, um, captain of the host of the king of Syria. But he was a leper. And his wife had a little maid from Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she, she said to her mistress, I would, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, he would recover from his leprosy. So we know what happens. We know the uh, the king of Syria wrote a letter to the king of Israel and said, I'm sending this guy and he's going to, uh, you know, I want you to recover my, my leprosy. And, of course, the king of Israel, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And so he gets all upset. And Elisha says, send him down to me, which is where he should have gone to start with. And he gets down to Elisha. And Elisha says, sends a messenger unto him saying, go 
wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Now, what stood between Naaman and his cleansing? Water. But was it just water? Did it, any kind of water? No. Specifically, it was the water of Jordan. But it wasn't really the water as much as it was, what did you do with the water, Naaman? See, Naaman said, well, right, I'm going to go and I'm going to get in the Jordan River. Well, first he got mad. He wanted to get into a different river. And his, his servants told him, you know, if you do something great, you'd have done that, wouldn't you? And he said, yeah. So he, he went back and he dipped in the Jordan River seven times. But what stood between Naaman and the blessing of being cleansed? It was water. But it wasn't because there was something special about the water. It was about obedience. If it was just water, why didn't he just go dip one time? See, it's not about just the water, the right element. It's not about the person, Naaman. It's about obedience in regard to the water. Naaman was told to dip seven times. If he had dipped six, he would he'd still have been a leper. If he had dipped five, he'd been a leper. If he had dipped seven times in the Abana or the Farpar River, he'd still been a leper. See that? So it's about being obedient using the command that God says. God said, go dip seven times in the Jordan River. Now if he had told him to go dip seven times in buttermilk, that would work too. But he didn't. It was all about the specifics. And that's what Naaman obeyed. So these are just pictures of what God has planned for baptism. And so when we're reading the Old Testament, we see, you know what? God told Naaman to go dip seven times in the Jordan River and he would have been cleansed. So God put water between Naaman and his cleansing. God put water between Israel and, and their being saved. God put... Uh, you know, God put water between all of these uh, uh, these blessings of these different people in, in order to uh, uh, in order to bless them. Uh, you might look at even the Jordan River. Israel had to cross the Jordan River. Now they weren't baptized in the Jordan River, but still it separated them between between uh, the Promised Land and uh, where they were, so they had they had to go into the Jordan River. You have the um, uh, you also have the flood. Uh, remember Noah? You know the Bible says Noah was saved by water. A lot of people say, "Well, now he was saved by the ark." No, the Bible says he was saved by water. The Bible says he was saved by water. We'll get into that in a moment. And so God put water between Noah and the, you know, the new world. Just like he puts water between the sinner and the new life in Christ. All right? So the point is, you see the pattern here, how God uses baptism, how God uses water. So it shouldn't be so strange when you come to the New Testament and you find that God has put baptism, that is water, between man and a blessing. In Mark 16, 16, the very last thing, the last thing that Christ said before he ascended to heaven had to do with go to all the world and preach the gospel. He said, preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now, that's important. That's important because it's showing that God intended for man to be saved and he provided for man to be saved. But what's the between man and salvation? Baptism. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Friends, I, I don't want you to open your Bible and just look at that verse. Mark 16, 16. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Someone says, well, see, it doesn't say he that is baptized not shall be damned. Friends, you won't be baptized if you don't believe. You won't do the first thing if you don't believe. You know, if you if you won't do the first thing, what makes you think you're going to get to the last thing? All right? Now, can a person believe and be saved at that point? No. The devils believe and tremble, but they're not saved. 
A person has to a person has to repent. But if they just repent, believe and repent, is that enough? No. While it's true, they have to repent, except you repent, you'll likewise perish. Luke thirteen three. God commands all men everywhere to repent. Um Acts seventeen about verse thirty or thirty one. But just if you stop there, that's not enough. You have to confess Christ and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, if you don't believe, you're certainly not going to repent. If you don't believe, you're not going to confess Christ as Lord if you don't believe it. And if you don't believe that baptism is going to forgive your sins, you're not going to do that either. That's why Jesus said, He that believeth not shall be damned. Because you'll never get to the you'll never get to the step the last step, the final step that stands between you and salvation. But it must have been important because the last thing Jesus said was either believe in the baptized shall be saved. Now, how do I know that that's what God has done with baptism? Well, just look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. 1 Peter 3, 21. Peter says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Baptism saves us. Now you say, well, well James, I, 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 I don't think baptism saves us. Well, there's a, there's a verse that says it does. Friends, you realize there's over a hundred verses that talk about baptism or being baptized or things like that in the New Testament? Over a hundred. If God had talked about baptism in regard to salvation, one time that that made it important enough to study but he said it more than a hundred times now I think that's pretty important and so the like figure where to ba even baptism doth also now save us someone says well that's just one verse that says baptism saves us do you need more than one would you obey it if it was two would you would you do it if it was three Five, ten? How many, how many verses do you need that says baptism doth also now save us in order to believe that baptism is connected to your salvation? And if you don't believe that that's water baptism, just back up to the next verse, back up one verse. He's talking about Noah, the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. What saved, Mo what saved Noah? What saved Noah and those eight souls in the ark? Water. What saves us today? Baptism. What kind of baptism? Water. Baptism in water. But it has to be for the right reason, not just being dunked in water. So, eight souls were saved by water, the life figure born into baptism does all now save us. What saved Noah? Water. What saves us? Baptism. Baptism must be baptism in water. And God puts it between man and salvation. Friends, everywhere you in the New Testament where you read about baptism and salvation, when you when you find them two together, whether it's salvation or or forgiveness of sins, remission of sins, whatever. Baptism always comes first. Always. Always. It always comes first. Someone says, well, you know, I got saved and then two months later we had a, you know, the baptism Sunday and we all went down to the creek and broke the ice on the river and and we was all baptized. No. Well, you might have you been put in the water, but that wasn't biblical baptism. Biblical baptism, people were baptized and then saved. And anytime someone tells me that they were that they were saved and then baptized, I know right then they hadn't read their Bible. They hadn't read the Bible, hadn't been taught from the Bible. Because baptism in the Bible, baptism always comes before salvation. Let's look at another one in Acts two, verse thirty eight. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Baptism always comes before what you before the blessing, remission of sins. You want remission of sins? You gotta be baptized. Repent and be baptized first. I don't no one really argues that repentance is essential 
are a prerequisite. That is, no one argues that repentance comes before salvation. Can you be saved without repenting? No. And Peter put repentance and baptism together and says, either repent, repent and be baptized in the name of you, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the rest of sins. If repentance comes before the rest of sins, then so does baptism because Peter put them in the same verse together. Same thing um, Saul of Tarsus was told, Acts 22, verse 16. And now why tearest thou? Arise and be baptized. Wash away thy sins. What did Saul want? He wanted his sins washed away. What did he have to do before that in order to get them washed away? He had to be baptized. And this is, what, this is my point, friends. Baptism always comes before salvation. Salvation always comes after baptism. It always comes after baptism. And so I'm, I'm just saying when you look at, at the pattern, God always puts baptism in a specific place. In the New Testament, it's just to see if man will do what God wants him to do. So, well, that doesn't make any sense to be baptized in water. I didn't write the book, friends. You know, don't argue with me. I didn't write the book. I'm just reading it. I'm just telling you what the book says. The book says that God's blessings for today are going to come after you've been baptized for the remission of sins. After, you, after a, a scriptural candidate, someone who, who meets all the qualifications uh, to be saved, who have their, need their sins uh, remitted, need their sins forgiven, when that person willfully obeys God, submits to his will, believes, repents, confesses Christ before man and is baptized, their sins will be forgiven. And it's only until they go through that door. That's why I'm uh, in, in Ephesians 5 verse 6. Look, Ephesians 5 verse 26. Sorry. Ephesians 5 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, according to the word's instructions, that's how that's how the church would purify. Now, you want, you want another example of how God puts water between man and obtaining something? I figure there's a lot of people out there that are that are happy. You know, that they've got the, they got their joy, joy, joy down in their heart, they say. Well, do you know true joy comes from obeying God? And did you know when you look in the New Testament, you know what you find? You find that baptism is right there in between the sinner and rejoicing. You think about it. In, in Acts 16, Acts 16, and we're going to start verse 25. Now, this is the Philippian jailer. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the earth prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, waking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners fled. I don't think he was having a very good day. Was he? Verse 28, then, But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He wasn't having a good day, was he? Boy, he was, he was rough. He was not a happy camper. He was scared to death. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. You know what? He still wasn't happy. He still was not happy. Verse 32, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all the word of his house. You know why they did that? They spake unto him the word of the Lord because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But how can they believe if they hadn't, hadn't been taught? How could he believe on Jesus if he hadn't been taught? So he had to hear something. Well, what's going to produce faith? The word of faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So they taught unto him the word of God in order to produce faith so that he could be taught and so that then he could believe. And once he believes, what's he going to do? He's going to have to repent. 
He took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. That's repentance. He must have confessed. We don't have the record of him confessing, but we know that that's essential to, to their salvation according to Acts chapter 8 and verse 36. The, the eunuch was told, you must confess. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them. Now listen, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Now he's rejoicing. Why? Because he believed and he was baptized. Now he's happy. Now he's happy. You want, you want one more? Look at this. In Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, verse 9, Saul of Tarsus meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, blinded, winds up going to Damascus, and there is there three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. He's not having a good day, is he? He's not real happy. And there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight and inquire of the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. He has seen a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And I will show him great things. He must suffer my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, that sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes that had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And he had, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Oh, that's, that's a lot better, isn't it? You know, you, you feel so down, you feel depressed, you don't want to eat, you just so distraught, and then all of a sudden, everything's better. Now I got my appetite back. When did that happen? After he was baptized, after he knew he had obeyed the Lord. You want one more? We want to go back to our friend, the unit. Acts chapter 8, verse 38. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So we know he's been baptized. And then verse 39, And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. When was he happy? Friends, God puts the ultimate joy, the joy of salvation, he puts it after baptism. Baptism always comes before the ultimate joy of salvation. Knowing that you have done what the Lord says, knowing that you've been obedient to the gospel. That's where God put baptism. That's where he put water. And 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 if you want to look at it this way, in Galatians 3, verse 27, baptism is between stands between the sinner and entering Christ. In Ephesians 1, verse, thir uh, verse 3, the Bible says, <clears throat> that God, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ, in Christ, all spiritual blessings in Christ, repentance, or remission of sins, redemption, forgiveness of sins, mercy, grace, all of these things are in Christ. How do you get into Christ? How do you get into Christ where all these blessings are? Salvation is in Christ, 2 Timothy 2, verse 10. <clears throat> I know we've gone over the, the, uh, a list before of things that, that are said to be in Christ. So how do you get into Christ? Galatians 3, verse 27. Galatians 3, and verse 27, Paul says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Friends, if I told you, I, I don't know if you like, I use this illustration in class. I don't know if you like walking through spider webs. I hate walking through spider webs. But just imagine a door that's just covered 
so thick with spider webs. I mean, if you've ever seen Indiana Jones, that's what I think about Indiana Jones going to that tunnel or cave, whatever, and there's spider webs all over him. Or if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you you know, old, old Frodo's and tangled up in spider webs. I mean, do you not walk through spider webs? I don't. But what if someone said, well, you know what, there's $10 million. All you have to do is go through that door of spider webs. Would you go through it? Man, I'd be through in a heartbeat. It doesn't make any sense to me. Why would you put spider webs up there? I don't know. Just to see if you'll do it. Why did God put water before salvation? Because God did it. Because that was His plan. Just to see, just to see if you're willing to do it. See if you'll obey Him. You say, well, it doesn't make sense. Well, God didn't ask you if it made sense. God wants to see if you'll obey Him. And so baptism is going to come before salvation. It's going to come before all the blessings that are in Christ. Because that's where God put it. That's where God put it. See, friends, we need to realize that God has always set something between men and those blessings. And we, it's up to us, it's up to us to go through that door. Baptism is the door into Christ. Uh, you know, sometimes when you're studying the Bible, if you'll just look at some parallels, I don't know, I've got a couple minutes here, three minutes. I don't know if I can get this done or not. In uh, in John three, I'll try. John three. Jesus said, uh, "We're looking at verse five. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom. He cannot see the kingdom of God." Now, in Mark sixteen sixteen, Jesus said, "He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved." So look at the parallel. Jesus said, except a man. In Mark 16, 16, he says, he. Then you have entering the kingdom of God. John 3. Mark 16, he says, shall be saved. The parallel is between the kingdom of God and being saved. The parallel is between he and a man. All right, those two verses are parallel. So, Whatever keeps a man from entering the kingdom of God is the same thing that stands between man and receiving salvation. You put those two verses together. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You know what that means? That means being born again is the same as being, is believing and being baptized. Being born again is the same as believing and being baptized. And so anybody that wants to be saved, anybody that wants to enter the kingdom, has to go through that process, has to go through that door. And friends, this is what I'm saying. It's not about, for us, we understand the Bible is not teaching water salvation. We understand that the Bible is teaching obedience and water, baptism, baptism in water is just part of God's plan. It's nothing special about the water. No one ever said, we believe you're saved by faith, by water only, or baptism only. You're saved by obedience to God, which means being baptized for the rest of sins. Friends, I've, I've got less than a minute, <clears throat> so I'm going to give you my content information. hope this is help, helpful. We'll continue more on this some other time, maybe. But 276-340-2653 is my phone number, 276-340-2653. Always make sure that what you're getting is a word from the Lord. And if we can help you in any way, we want to do that very thing. Thanks for listening. God bless and have a good night.